Wonderful. Good. Everyone enjoying their New Year so far? <laughs> Excellent. You know, uh, Joe told me a couple things earlier as he came in, and I wanted to share them with you. I thought they were awesome. I asked him how he was doing, and uh, he said he was too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> you guys agree with that? That's a good answer. I like that. And I said, no, but really, how are you feeling? He said, man, I'm just too anointed to be disappointed. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm feeding people. Yeah. I'm being a good usher. So well, if it's your first time here, we'd like to welcome you to the speakers. Did you um, ride your motorcycle in? Trinity Speakers Forum. Did you? To cool. The Temecula Speakers Forum. We have uh, gone into a monthly meeting, so we'll be here the first Wednesday of every month, and we're so stoked to really give that first fruit to God. So we encourage you to mark that off on your calendar. We have a phenomenal speaker every month, as you'll see today and uh, the upcoming months, that every speaker is going to be different, dynamic, unique, but just absolutely engaging. And I think uh, one of my favorite things about the Speaker Swarm personally is I learn something new every meeting that I can actually apply into my life. It's not just some kind of head knowledge. It actually transforms my heart and gets me to, to live closer and in communion with God and fulfill His calling over my life. How many of you want to fulfill your destiny? Amen. Oh, amen. amen. And that's really one of our purposes here at the Speakers Forum. The Word of God says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. So we always book guest speakers from all different parts of the body of Christ who will encourage you with the Word of God. Sometimes they might correct you and whip you with the Word of God, but we know only that's because they love you. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. And uh, if it is your first time here, we'd love to connect with you and send you an email letting you know of our upcoming speakers. We don't blast your inbox. We'll send you an email once a week and just keep you updated on our upcoming speakers. And uh, if you find it interesting, please, I encourage you to forward that to someone who you think would be relevant to hear the message or the speaker that we're going to have that week. Also, if you have your cell phone, I would ask you to please go ahead and just pull it out real quick and make sure you put it on silent or vibrate. That would be amazing. And lastly, how many of you believe in the power of prayer? I would save the best for last. Amen. All the rest of you can repent later. We're yeah, not believing. No, I'm sure you were just eating. We would love to pray for you. We do have a segment in the Connect card where you can write a prayer request. If your life is perfect and you don't need any prayer, just write a prayer request for somebody else and we will make sure to pray over them. We've had so many amazing <coughs> answers to prayer and um, so we'd just be privileged to do that for you. Now today to welcome our guest speaker, I thought I would ask Pastor Mike to come on up and uh, introduce our guest speaker. So give it up for Pastor Mike Grasky. Well, thank you for being here. Um, you know, when God, when God does things, He does things in a timely manner, and He does things just right. It's like natural. I mean... I've never, it's so natural, I've never seen a person naturally wear a beard as well as a lot. That is just natural. I didn't know you were going there with that. You know, I didn't know I was going there either. But two years ago, Doc Somerville, uh, who's hosting us here, said to me, you know, Mike, you ought to meet and get to know my brother. I don't know if somebody who's more knowledgeable about Israel and the Middle East and so John and his wife Mary joined us a couple of years ago for our Easter. And after I heard his first talk, I thought, oh my goodness. He has the hottest topic on the planet today. <laughs> and God's timeliness is that, number one, for 44 plus years, John has the historical and biblical knowledge of Israel and the Middle East. But graduate of the Army Navy War College and part of the Intelligence Corps and being in the military, he has a unique strategic military look at things too. Blend those together and the hottest topic today is world terrorism 
terrorists behind the Middle East, Israel, what God is doing is Israel, and how that applies to us in America, and how we can respond. So John, I think it's God's great timing that he would give you grace 40-something years ago to pick up the, the, the God's call on his nation, Israel. So God bless you for being here, Kick, kicking our first speaker for him off this year. Couldn't be a better choice. And that I present Colonel John Somerville. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Figure out how this, oh, it works. Oh, isn't that clever? I'm, I'm really not good at all this stuff, but to find a typewriter that will spell out Zion's Watchman um, was the highlight of my day, and I hope it's not the highlight of this whole talk. I don't know where I have to stand. Okay, I guess this is better. Um, this is, um, this is our ministry, and uh, we are um, uh, registered in uh, Texas because it's a lot easier to work in Texas than, <laughs> than it is in some other state. Uh, but I live in California. We live uh, right outside of Yosemite, uh, up in the middle of the state. We are committed to being a blessing to our nation the United States of America, to Israel, and to the Jewish people by all the things we do. And our mission is to speak out, to teach out, to educate, and inspire Americans to understand and activate the biblical mandate. It's in the Bible. It's mandated in the Bible. To be a blessing and not a curse to Israel and to Abraham's descendants and to consolidate American support to speak with one united voice to our nation's leaders, explaining why our nation must stand firmly in support of Israel and to keep America blessed. We have, any of you that are over, older than six months uh, will probably remember that our nation has been blessed tremendously by God in so many ways. Um, but that's not guaranteed. That is not something that says it is always going to remain this way. If you study any world history, you know that empires have risen and then they have fallen. And that seems to always be the pattern. Well, it doesn't have to be. And I'll talk more about why I believe we can make a change on this. We want to keep America blessed, free, and under the protective hands of God by being a light to the nations because it's apparent that we've been given such a godly miss mission for such a time as this. This really isn't um, necessarily part of what I'm going to talk about today, but I think it's very important because I have noticed this especially um, and, and especially among Christians uh, in the last few months. I have uh, people who say, oh, I'd love to go to Israel. I've always wanted to go to Israel. I've always wanted to do this, but I don't get on airplanes. Or, or they say it in other ways. You know, they're not going to say, I'm scared to get on an airplane. <laughs> you know, these are men that are talking to me. <laughs> and these are ministers, too. And they say, no, but I, you know, I just don't fly. I got one guy, he, he was an army guy, and I was talking to him and his wife, yes, we have to go, and, and all this kind of stuff. And he goes, no, I was in the infantry, I don't get in airplanes. Well, all he's saying is, I'm afraid to get in an airplane. And she says, yeah, and I always wanted to go to Hawaii, and he won't go to Hawaii, you know, and on and on. And I've, in the last few days, I've had these kind of conversations with more people who, when you get right to the bottom of it, fear is running their life. Fear is stopping them from just being a normal human being. And they won't admit it. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've never really pressed them on it. But I've been thinking about this so much. And I looked up this morning in 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, NIV, the spirit of, that God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The one I've always known is out of King James. This is kind of the new King James. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And yet, I believe it has inundated the church. 
fear to speak out. Oh, you know, somebody might laugh at me or, or it's not politically correct to say those kind of things and all that sort of stuff. Fear, uh, I can't get on an airplane. No, there's no way I could ever drive to Los Angeles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I won't tell you about the highway patrolman last night. <laughs> that was a wonderful experience. Um, <laughs> God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Put those together, a sound mind. It says uh, self-discipline in the NIV, sound mind. You know what? If you have a spirit of fear working in your life, you're crazy. It says God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind and of love and of power. And um, if we as believers are going to impact our nation for good before our lives are over, then we've got to throw off those shackles of fear, those things that have stopped us from either speaking out or from going somewhere or for doing something or taping, taking that step. I had a lady yesterday, <laughs> she was all ready to go to Israel. She was so fired up and she said, oh, I, all my life I've desired to go there and all this kind of stuff. And then she calls me and said, well, you know, I'm going to keep uh, praying till I feel God really wants me to go and all that stuff. I think that's a bunch of baloney. Who do you think put that desire in your heart in the first place. God's word says that he gives us the desires of our heart. Now when I first read that I knew he doesn't really do that because the real desires of my heart were not things that were godly. Then I realized he puts desires into our heart and he can bring it to pass. And when you lay it all on a platter and you say, here it is, this is what you've desired for so long and it's here and all you got to do is say yes, well, I'll, I'll just pray about this till I feel better about it and on and on. Now, I don't want to get into the theology of all that kind of stuff, but I think the, uh, the honest truth is we are getting gypped in our lives from the courage and the sound mind and the power and the love to step out on God's word and not, so, and not come back with all kinds of excuses. I'm not even talking about this today, so let's move on. <laughs> What in the world's going on? Has the world we thought we knew been turned upside down? It has. If you've been following world events um, uh, greatly, like I suppose I have uh, for a long, long time, everything we thought we knew is, has really been turned upside down in the last few years. What's going on in the Middle East? Is it any of our business? And what can be done about it? This is, a, this is a picture that, um, look, I put most of this stuff together this morning. So I don't know if this picture has been photoshopped or not. I don't remember a meeting between Rohani and our president. But um, nevertheless, there's certainly um, Iran and the United States have come together on this nuclear, on this deal. They don't, they don't call it a treaty because it's not a treaty. It's a deal. And um, in opposition to what most of the people in the United States want, when you look at, the, um, at all of the uh, polls, and when you look at what the Congress wants, this has strictly been taken out of their hands. This is a deal that has great significance for the United States and for the world because it really is a devilish deal aimed at Israel. And we did not need to make this. But wh who is this guy that our president is shaking hands with? His name is Rohani, and uh, that's him before he got older. Th this goes back to 1979 when <clears throat> the Ayatollah Khomeini came into Iran and changed the world forever. Because prior to 1979, that was a very, uh, it was a linchpin of American foreign policy in the Middle East. Yes, Israel was there, but the one country we relied on was Iran. It was the Shah of Iran. 
Jimmy Carter pulled the rug out from under him. It was the end of the Shah, and Khomeini came in and turned everything upside down. Khomeini, though, was attacked by um, uh, Saddam Hussein. And from 1980 to 1988, there was a war, and a lot of us were kind of glad it was going on because it was two enemies fighting each other. And so it, we kind of watched it go on. But this guy, Rouhani, who is now the president of Iran, who John Kerry and others refer to as a moderate, and, uh, you know, he's not crazy like Ahmadinejad. Look, Ahmadinejad was ugly. And so you could caricature him, and, and he looked kind of wacko. Then the new president is this guy, if I, if I can go back, and he smiles and he has this nice demeanor about him. But if you want to really know who he was, for eight years he was really the secretary of defense for Iran. And Iran did not have a very strong military in those days. And one of the things they had to do to go into battle was they had to clear minefields. And so at first, they started clearing minefields with donkeys, running them out there. But as soon as one donkey blew up, the others would scream and bray and everything, and they'd run away like normal human donkeys would do. <laughs> and they were running out of donkeys and they couldn't rely on them. So guess what Rohani did? He got children. And he gave children a little plastic key, and he said, when you, when you go to meet Allah, this is your key into heaven because you have given your life um, for Islam. And they marched tens of thousands of children through the minefields to clear them so that then the tanks could follow. This is not a nice man. I don't care if he is smiling some 40 years later. He's evil. And we have made a pact with the devil. This, these are some of the children. Once they went through their initial training, which was mostly brainwashing, then they got these red headbands that said, I am a volunteer for martyrdom. And they believed it. And they marched in straight lines right through minefields, and thousands of them went to their death because of our new friend there in Iran. Um, Iran um, has been blatantly um, developing new missiles that can carry nuclear warheads. And they make no bones about it, even though the UN resolutions have forbidden this for a long time, and the same thing goes in this deal that John Kerry cooked up with them, they're not to be doing this, and they're doing it blatantly. And they fired several off right near our um, USS Harry S. Truman, um, our aircraft carrier out there just last week. And what happened was sanctions, <laughs> We were supposed to put new sanctions on them for doing this. And the White House announced it one day, and by the next day they said, oh, we'll just hold off on those. By releasing the sanctions that we made in this deal with Iran, we are unfreezing $150 billion that will go into their economy. And it's not going to go for new schools or anything else like that. They are the number one provocateur and supplier of, of terrorists, not of tourists, but of terrorists all around the world. Um, the White House delayed the new sanctions on Iran. Um, it shows already that Iran, in fact, doesn't give one hoot about this deal and we're the ones that are holding on to this deal um, and and now oh, I I'm lose my words over it. I'm not here to talk about this anyway. Okay. Now this was a headline that the CIA is watching for Iran nuclear collaboration with North Korea. If you saw the news this morning, North Korea um, claims that they tested a hydrogen bomb. Whether it was a hydrogen bomb or it was, it was a nuclear bomb, whether it was uranium or plutonium or hydrogen, really doesn't matter. They did it today. Guess who they're doing it for? They're doing it for Iran. 
because there's nothing in the deal that was recently made that prohibits them from farming this out to another nation like North Korea. Um, Kerry and his crew left a loophole a mile wide when they effectively allowed Iran to conduct all the illicit work at once outside of Iran in countries like North Korea. Um, I think he goes to my barber, um, <laughs> is, is maybe the best thing I can say about him. North Korea says it has the H-bomb of justice after the nuclear test. This is a headline uh, just this morning. Um, and why, the reason I'm saying all this is trying to sh show, even though you don't need to know it, trying to show that the world that we've known and that we were uh, pretty comfortable and relaxed with is churning now. Things are turning over at a mad rate. This was the... Um, it, he was actually an imam nobody heard about, but he was in um, Saudi Arabia, and when the Arab Spring started, he was stirring up the Shiites in Saudi Arabia to overthrow the king. This goes back almost five years now. And they had enough evidence, and they tried him, and they convicted him, and then this last uh, week, um, they put not only him, but 46 others to death who had tried to overthrow. Then this was used because Iran, because he was originally from Iran, Iran then had the people in the street attack the Saudi Arabian embassy and they set it on fire and they did all that stuff. Which causes Saudi Arabia to sever their ties with Iran. Saudi Arabia has been the big dog um, in the Middle East. The other big dog trying to grow stronger and stronger has been Iran. If you think about the Gulf out there where 20% um, of all the world's oil goes through um, every day, the Gulf is called what? Persian Gulf if you're on the Iranian side and it's called the Arabian Gulf if you're on the Arab side and it's the same body of water. And they've been fighting over this for years and years and cartographers don't know what to call it. Um, that it, it implies though who are the two main powers out there and for Saudi Arabia to cut ties with Iran is very significant and then Sudan followed they cut their ties um, just yesterday Bahrain uh, severs ties with these are headlines by the way United Arab Emirates downgrades the Iranian t so all of those small and large countries in the Gulf area they have been afraid of Iran forever and ever. By the way, we call it Iran. But if you were in on this lecture in 1934, <laughs> was anybody? No, I wasn't either. But in 1935, Iran changed its name from Persia to Iran. Why would they do that? The, Persian Empire had lasted for thousands of years. These people were Persians and yet they changed their name in 1935. You know what was going on in Europe in 1935? Hitler had been in power for two years. Hitler was promulgating all these kinds of things about the Aryan race and the Germans were the pure Aryans and, and the Jews, their bloodline was getting in and all that sort of stuff. And the government in Persia at that time agreed so wholeheartedly with Hitler that they changed the name of their country to the land of the Aryans, Iran. And it has not changed since. And all of the things that Hitler was proposing starting in 1933 when he first was elected through 35, all the way through 45, all of those things, just take it and transfer it over to the Iranian government today. They believe absolutely the same things. They would kill every Jew in the world if they got in, into that kind of power. So what we're talking about here also has great spiritual significance really great spiritual significance. In the book of Daniel, you'll see Daniel was praying one time and this angel appeared and apologized. He said, I was held up for 21 days. Do you remember by who? The king of Persia. That was 
a spiritual demon because it's still a hotbed of that from a biblical standpoint. If Gabriel or one of those archangels of God is held up for 21 days by a spiritual, and he said, you know, and I had to call your angel, speaking about Israel's angel, Michael, I had to call Michael in to give me a hand on this. Tell me that that has changed. It has not changed. Everything that's, for the most part, that is stirring all over the world from ISIS to Al-Qaeda, you name it all, has its tentacles deeply coming out of Iran. And we're playing nice with them. We're giving them everything they want. Uh, Kuwait recalled its ambassador to Iran. Oh, and then here's, here's who's going to make everything fine. Russia puts up its hand and says, let me come in and I will um, negotiate this deal between... Um, and there he is. Okay. I don't really want, I don't want to really get into this whole thing because a lot of times I explain the, the Sunnis who they are and the Shiites who they are and a lot of people say, ah, oh, it doesn't matter anyway, it's just denominational fighting. It's much more than that. But the, the world out there, and by the way, Iran is not Arab. They are Iranians, they are Persians, they're not Arab. Sometimes we say, oh, they're all Arabs out there. Turkey is not Arab. But yet, they all are Islam. But then Islam is divided into its own uh, sects. Um, Sunnis comes from the word Sunnah, or the way of Muhammad, and it's opposed to a bloodline succession to Muhammad. Much of this has to be, who is the caliphate? Who is the caliph? Who can succeed from Muhammad and be head over all of Islam? And the Shiites comes from uh, Shiatu Ali, or the partisans of Ali. Um, and uh, you know what, I'm, I'll get wrapped up in this and, and then I'll forget it anyway, okay? <laughs> it's, it, it is important if you really get down into the weeds on this. Um, it's extremely important, but not so much for what I'm talking about now. Erdo Erdogan, by the way, Erdogan is the new president of Turkey. He was the prime minister, now he's moved to become the president, and he was asked, what kind of a presidential system would you really like to have? On a, on a recent, very recent, within the last two weeks, he was um, asked that, and he said, oh, I think Hitler's was really good. And an example of an effective presidential system. I'm talking now about Turkey. Turkey is an ally of the United States. But Turkey has been moving further and further away um, in their actions and everything else, and yet we're pretending it's not happening. This is um, uh, the president now, Erdogan. He's attempting to change the Constitution. And... Um, I mean, Turkey is an excellent example of a, of a study of an empire um, that was in demise for a long time, but yet has these ideas of taking over all in the Middle East. And so the Arab world is caught between the Turks on one hand and the Iranians on the other hand, and yet they all share a common uh, religion. Now, Erdogan looks like uh, your average um, president. Uh, he's in clothing like the picture I found of Hitler to show that he wears a suit. But then, when he puts this kaffiya around his shoulders, he's saying something totally different. This is showing that he's all for the Palestinians. That he wants to be the leader of that faction. He's not a Palestinian, but he's standing up for them. So when you see people today wearing a kaffiya like that, whether they have it on their head or just wrapping it around, and a lot of people, I know on college campuses, a lot of kids are wearing these. They don't really know what it is. It's just kind of cool. It looks kind of nice. But it's making a statement, and it was legitimized by Arafat starting in 1964. 
1964, Arafat's wearing that kind of kafia all the time, and it has great meaning today. And when you see the president of a nation coming out and putting that on, he is making a statement. And to you and I, it usually, well, I don't know why he's wearing that, but it doesn't mean anything. Yes, it does. It does to the people that he wants following his line. He came out with something very unusual. For the last five years, he's been damning Israel every chance he can. He's moving away from Israel. And just the other day, he said, you know, we really need each other. Well, what happened? He got isolated by Russia when he shot down a Russian airline, uh, a Russian fighter jet uh, over his... Um, over his border recently. Now he finds himself kind of on the out, so now he's trying to make nice with Israel. There's something going on. There are changes going on in the Middle East where now we find Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and a lot of these Arab countries in agreement with Israel. Never happened before. And we've got one country, Turkey, that was so much fighting against Israel over the last five years is now all of a sudden turning around. I mean by now I'm talking about this week. So it's churning. Things are really changing a lot. Egypt just sent a new ambassador to Israel. For three years there was no connection between Israel and Egypt and all of a sudden Egypt now is an ally of Israel. There's a real change happening. The White House was caught spying on Bibi. You may have read that last week. The news came out that um, the president has said we're not going to spy on friends, with the exception of Israel. <laughs> and it's not, look, everybody spies on everybody else. When I was a kid, I read Mad Magazine, and there was a thing in there, a spy versus spy. Every, every month that was going, okay, that goes on. We want to know what our friends are going to do, and, and we have to pick all that sort of stuff up. They're doing it to us. It's not a big deal. But when you focus in on the president, uh, on the prime minister of our major ally and we're going after all of his cell phones, all of his phone calls and everything else. Um, that's uh, a different way of playing the game. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, get, leave your kindred and from your father's house unto the land that I will show thee. Genesis 12, 1. And I will make thee, Abraham, a great nation. And I'll bless thee, and I'll make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And he said, it's not on an airplane, is it? I hope I don't have to go on an airplane to fly all that way, because, you know, <laughs> he didn't even know where he was going. This man stepped out. I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. God either meant it or he was pulling our leg, which makes him a liar. And he meant it. And history proves that he has meant it and still means it today. I'm going to bless them that bless you, curse him that curses you. And you follow this in Genesis, and it's not only Abraham, but it's Abraham's son. It's his grandson. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that same promise. And then it says, and your seed forever. His descendants are the Jews today. And I don't care where they live, whether it's in Israel or whether it's in Temecula, that promise still stands. That's not a threat. You bless them, God will bless you. You curse them, God will curse you. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's what's going on in Israel today is absolutely unbelievable to the world because I just showed you some of the mess that's going on in the Middle East. I didn't even talk about Syria where nobody knows how many have been killed there in the last five years. 250 to 300,000 people have died in that fighting up to the north. Fighting is going all around in the Middle East. In Israel, it's not happening. Israel is prospering. And when it says, in thee all families of the earth will be blessed, if you just start to look up the tremendous medical miracles 
that are coming out of Israel that are affecting all of us. The technological um, advances. You, no, your cell phone would not even, you wouldn't even have one if it hadn't been for what's coming out of Israel. There are blessings going out to the world out of that tiny little country. I drew this up just so you would understand it better. And this voice comes out of heaven and says to Abraham, those who bless thee, I will bless. And he said, wow. And those who curse thee, I will curse. Really? Does that apply to the White House? He says, hey, you're not going to get me into a political argument. <laughs> My mother always told me, Johnny, that she was the only one who could call me that. <laughs> Well, she really said, stupid. <laughs> Don't talk to people about religion or politics. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. That's all I talk about. <laughs> because they are entwined. And we live in a democracy. And God has given us um, the freedom to be living in this country and the freedom to be involved in making those kinds of decisions. And if we don't, um, well, you're going to get me into play. I'm going to bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I'll curse. By the way, it's an unconditional promise. Unconditioned. There's no conditions on it. You do it, God will do it. You don't do it, God won't do it. Um, it's unconditional. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or whether you're a... Um, Muslim or whether you're a nothing, whether you're an atheist, doesn't matter. If you bless Abraham's descendants, if you bless the Jews, God must bless you. There's no conditions on it except to do it. On the other hand, if you curse Israel, you curse the Jews, God said, I'm going to curse you. And the idea was, don't do it. Do something on the positive side. It's unconditional. And it's applicable to you as an individual. I know it is in my own life as an individual. It's applicable to my church, to my family, to my community. And it is applicable to our nation. Blessing or cursing. You make the choice. And we get to make those kind of choices when we go to the voting booth and vote or when we don't go. We're voting if we don't. How do you curse Israel? The Hebrew word is galal, and it means to treat with contempt. I used to think it had something to do with swearing. Cursing, you know, curse words and cussing and all that sort of stuff. It isn't that word at all. God's word says whoever curses means to treat with contempt. And I must say that within the last seven years, the prime minister and the, of Israel has been treated with contempt every time he's gone to the White House. Treat with contempt. To be slighted. To purposely ignore. To disesteem what God has esteemed. Some years ago, my one aunt was in her, in her, I don't know, maybe close to 90 or something. And uh, I went back there and picked her up and, and picked up my mom. And I, we were going to go out to eat. And I saw a place, never in our town had, been, had there been a place that uh, had bagels. And I said, oh, bagels. Let's go in there. And my mom says, yeah. And my aunt goes, no. There might be Jews in there. <laughs> now, we kind of laugh about it. But... If you'd been raised in kind of the anti-Semitic talk that I'd always heard in my family and all the rest of that, um, you'd kind of understand that reaction. Here's a lady for some 90 years didn't want anything to do with Jews because that's kind of how she'd been raised. And it was like a knife in my heart. What? You know, I mean, she's 90 years old. I'm not going to change her mind. That's to disesteem. That's to ignore. That's to slight. That's to avoid. I'm not going there. There's Jews in that neighborhood. Whew. To disesteem what God has esteemed. Whoever ignores, slights, disesteems, or treats you, Abraham and your descendants, with contempt, God says, I'll curse. That's heavy stuff. 
And, and I mean, it's really heavy stuff to me because I know what I heard all of my growing up years. I never heard one good thing about Jews. To not teach the biblical truth about Israel is to disesteem Abraham's descendants as well as God's plan and purposes for them and for Israel. God has a plan. It is being worked out now. It is happening now. It's, and the reason I can say it's happening now is because in Israel there is prosperity, there is peace, there is safety. People always ask me, oh, aren't you afraid to go to Israel? Yes, I am. That's why I go there every chance I get. Just to prove <laughs> that it's not something to be afraid of. Um, the, the last week in November I was there and uh, I had to go, I had to find an address of an, of an apartment in a neighborhood in Jerusalem that I'd never been before. It's dark, it's about 10 o'clock at night. I'm walking in the streets. It's kind of rainy, dark, you know. You ought to be scared because boy, those, they're out ready to stab everybody. And a woman runs by. And you might say, oh my gosh, who was chasing her? No, I realized she was jogging. And then another woman, an Orthodox Jewish woman, I could tell by the way her hair was and, and all the rest of that. They're out running at night, and then two uh, teenage girls came down the street and they're eating ice cream cones. This is 10 o'clock at night with no lights in the street. It's not dangerous. I looked up the statistics between how many people have been killed or shot in Israel compared with Chicago. Look it up. Look it up. You'll be, it's unbelievable. The last week there were two people killed in Israel by this guy. You saw it on TV over and over again, I'm sure. He got an Uzi and he shot up this place and two were killed and seven were wounded. That's a terrible tragedy. But the very same night in Chicago, three were shot and killed and 17 were wounded. That never got on anybody's paper. Um, whether or not it's done on purpose or inadvertently, it's still a curse. If you don't hear anything about Israel in your church, find another church. They are avoiding it. That is, the, that is one of the primary means of showing people today that scripture is real, that God's promises are real, that God's prophecies are real because it's happening today. If you never hear about it, then... <laughs> well, anyway, all right, let me move on. I ought to um, get to what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> For, <laughs> these are questions. For what purpose... <laughs> yeah. Where's... <laughs> I'm supposed to get a signal. There's supposed to be a big hook that'll come down and tear me out of here. For what purpose did the Lord choose a people, promise them a land, let them fall into slavery, bring them out of Egypt? You know I'm talking about Israel. What purpose did He exile them from their land, saw them scattered over the face of the earth, promised to bring them back to their land, promised to make the desolate land bloom and prosper? For what purpose is... Today, the Lord bringing the Jewish people home, making the desolate, desolate land bloom and prosper, settling the Jewish people in the way. What's God up to? Why did he do all that stuff over thousands of years? And, and why is he doing something uh, different? What's his purpose in promising and doing all these things? He repeated his purpose 59 times in just the book of Ezekiel then you will know that I am the Lord. This is high def. It's in the, should be in the sky. Everything that's going on there today should tell us that there is a God and that they, then you will know that I am the Lord. It's this truth that must be accepted before events in the Middle East can be understood. God is doing it for His name's sake. Now, this is a nice chorus line. Not everybody's on there. Some of them have dropped off. They, they all want to be president. They all want to sit in the highest seat in the world. And, and I want to know something from them. 
I want to know what is their response to a question. I always try to get these things into these debates. This question, has God ever judged nations? I'd love to hear some of them handle that one. And then how does God judge nations? And why would our nation be judged? There'd be a variety of answers from these folks if they had the time to tell the truth. And some of them would just stand there with their mouth closed because, well, I don't know. I don't know what the polls say about this. Um, try to get that question into debates. Send emails. Try to tweet, whatever you do. Try to get that stuff in. I want to know about the spirituality of these candidates. We have overlooked those things for years and years. And we are where we are as a nation because of that. We have voted or not voted in people without that spiritual dimension to their lives. And without that spiritual dimension, they're never going to be able to see through the kind of world problems. How God judges nations. Joel 3, 1 and 2 says... In those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, he's doing it today. Israel is prospering. The rest of the Middle East is going down the tubes. God is raising them up so the world will know that there is a God and he's got a plan. And I know that you and I want to be on the side of that plan. It says, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I'm going to gather all nations. This is the judgment of nations. This is what God's Word says about it. It says, this is what nations are judged on. We say, oh, you know, God's really going to judge us for abortions, for gay marriage, for all those kind of things. That's fine, and we probably will be judged somewhat on that, but nations here, specifically in the Bible... God says, nations, I'm going to bring them to the Valley of Josephat. I'll enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance. If you've had something left to you in a family where an uncle died or grandmother died and she had all this stuff and then she wanted to make sure nobody was ever mad at her and she left a little piece of this and that or, or I give the whole farm to my kids, you want to see <laughs> families split up? over inheritance and God says I'm going to judge them about my inheritance this is in the will they're his and he, in case there's any doubt about what his inheritance is it says my inheritance my people Israel four nations did this two things that nations do that will bring judgment on them. They scattered my people among the nations. Now we can read from history the nations that drove the Jews out of the land. But what we don't recognize is the other side of the coin. There are things that nations do that keep the Jews from coming back when God is calling them back. Britain did this. Britain kept the Jews out in the 1930s when they were trying to escape from Hitler, trying to get into the land of Israel, and Britain kept them out. Britain is no longer a empire, an empire. It's, they have nice little baby royal babies, you know, and they have royal marriages, and that's about it. They are not a world power. Overnight, they went from the greatest empire in the history of the world to royal baby makers for they scattered whatever they are for they scattered my people and they divided my land it's only 8,000 square miles the land of Israel today I live in Madera County our adjoining county is Fresno County put our two counties together it's the same size as Israel 8,000 square miles it's teeny God is not greedy he made it all anyway but he says only this is my land. Eight times in Scripture, he talks about Israel being my land. Don't divide my land. Don't cut it up. Every time we insist on Israel making a Palestinian state out of the heartland of Israel, we are doing this. We are dividing the land, scattering my people, dividing the land. The day of the Lord is near for all nations as you have done as a nation. Toward Israel, toward the land, or toward the people, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. 
Iran has been signing their own death warrant for years now with all this death to America, death to Israel, death to Israel, get a nuclear weapon and all that kind of stuff. I feel sorry, honestly I do, for the people of Iran. But it's leadership. It's leadership in any nation that determines whether the people are going to prosper and be blessed and be free or whether they're going to be oppressed. Look what Hitler. Hitler got voted in in 1933 and by 1945 Germany was destroyed. It was a pile of bricks. He destroyed that. But they voted him in. Same thing goes throughout history. Leadership will bring a blessing or it will bring a cursing and your deeds will return upon your head. God's promise to bless the nation that blesses the chosen people. History has proven nations that have blessed the Jewish people have had the blessing of God on them and the ones that have cursed the Jewish people have experienced the curse of God. What in the world's going on? Why is Israel always in the middle of it? Um, I'm running out of time here. Quite honestly, it is the official center of the world. Jerusalem is the center of the world. You, from a scriptural standpoint, that's the only standpoint worth looking at. And all things are going to culminate there anyway. And, um, and we're much closer today than the day you were born to being there. And we're seeing it. It is happening. I want you to have your eyes open to understand that. And God will give you direction what you can do about it. First thing is vote for people who get it. Vote for people who understand it. And they've got to have a biblical approach to it, not a Quranic approach. Sorry, that's not going to work. That's the size of Israel compared to the United States. Got tw you can fit 20 of them in California. Come on, quick, quick, quick. I'm running out of time. The hook's coming. <laughs> this is Israel in the Middle East, Turkey, Egypt, Iran. And just the things I talked about have, have changed quite a bit. It is very tiny. It's the most disputed strip of real estate on planet Earth because it's the one strip of land on planet Earth that God has a real plan for and it's going to happen whether or not we acknowledge it, whether or not we understand it, it's going to, but why not acknowledge it? Why not stand for it? Why not do something that you can do about it? Is America challenging? Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry to, to do this. Um, okay, I hope you're all getting this. Great, good. <laughs> Don't divide the land. Don't scatter my people. Why is Israel important to you? Our present future well-being is directly linked to our attitude toward Israel. I mean that as individuals and as families. The well-being of our family, the future of this little guy, is related to what our attitude toward Israel is. It's unfailing. It's going to be that because you'll be a blessing. God's going to bless you. God's going to bless your family. God's going to bless this guy up here in the front row. Our attitude toward Israel is our attitude toward God. The Bible is full of what God's attitude is toward Israel. So we better figure out where we want to be on this. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything politically that goes on over there. It's, it's still run by human beings and they make mistakes. It doesn't mean everything is perfect at all. But our attitude toward Israel, toward the Jews, is quite honestly our attitude toward God. You can be a born-again Christian and hate Jews. And I want to tell you what, God will not bless your life the way he wants to if you carry that kind of stuff. Why are Jewish people important to us? Our well-being is directly linked to the Jewish people. Our attitude toward the Jewish people is our attitude toward God's revealed word. There's so many things here to talk about. Jesus was Jewish. I didn't know that. I didn't know that as a kid. Quite honestly, I really didn't know that until the first time I went to Israel and I was already in my 20s. And I was born again. I had no idea Jesus was Jewish. Looked like a Swede to me. I had his picture in my bedroom. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. I didn't know he was Jewish. And by the way, he's still Jewish scripturally. And when he comes back as the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, guess what? I, scripturally, he's still going to be Jewish. 
Won't it be a blessing when he asks you, how'd you treat my kinfolk? He said, oh, I loved them. I blessed them. I was a blessing to them. That's what Matthew 25, when it talks about the king sitting on the throne and, and the sheep on one hand and the goats on the other, that's really what it's all about. Come by, I got this for a Christmas card. And at first I thought, hmm, this is weird. By combining Hanukkah and Christmas reminds us that we're celebrating the rededication. That's what Hanukkah is about. And the miraculous birth of the most Jewish baby ever born. Did any of you get a Christmas card with that on it? Then you weren't on my mailing list because that was, <laughs> that's my... <laughs> it really upset a lot of my old family. <laughs> They didn't get it at all. I don't think they read cards anyway. <laughs> because you read John 10, 22, Jesus was at Hanukkah and he was teaching in the temple courts in Solomon's porch. Uh, that's John 10, 22. If they hadn't called it the Feast of Dedication and they put in Feast of Hanukkah, it might have opened a lot of Christian eyes as they read John 10, say, Jesus was celebrating Hanukkah? I didn't know he was Jewish. Um, okay, Netanyahu is the toughest job in the world. He's surrounded by critics. Um, uh, anyway, that's why when you see my car out there, it's my wife's car actually. It has a. It has a. Showers of blessing. <laughs> What's the root of the conflict? I'm going to pretty well wrap it up here because the hook's coming. Netanyahu was asked this. It's the most, it's one of the best statements I've ever heard from a politician. He said the simple truth is the root of the conflict between the Palestinians and Israel was and remains the refusal to recognize the right of the Jewish people. And in Bible talk, it means God's chosen people. And he finished that sentence by saying, to a state of their own in their historic homeland. Historic homeland is the promised land. Usually when you take a politician's speeches and you, um, and you parse them and you cut it all up, it's nothing but hot air. But when you take this and he said, what's the conflict all about? It's number one, God does have a chosen people and he's got a promised land. And that's what the world fails to recognize. As a matter of fact, fights against. And the administration we have right now has been fighting against this for uh, the last seven years. Most repeated promise in the Bible, 141 times, and I won't I won't uh, bother you by reading you 141 of them. It says, I'm going to bring my people back. And they started coming back last century. Oh, that's confirmation. I like that. Israel's restoration. <laughs> and this is confirmation. God said, and I, I want to get to the bottom line in this because the bottom line is very important. In that day I'm going to restore David's fallen tabernacle. I'll repair its broken walls. And these are things God's going to do and in that last um, third um, paragraph down there says I'll bring my people Israel back from exile I'll rebuild the ruined cities and live in them they'll plant vineyards drink their wine I will plant Israel in their own land never again to be uprooted that is a promise and um, God's fulfilling it um, I saw Last year, when I was in Israel, I saw one of the lost tribes of Israel. Forever, it says the lost ten tribes, and they're gone, and nobody knows where they are. One of them came back. A friend of mine asked me, can you be at the airport tomorrow morning? You'll see something you'll never see again. And these people came in from northeast India. They're the tribe of Manasseh. And... Um, this, this fellow that I know got a letter. 
He was working for Netanyahu. And he got a letter and it said, we are the tribe, it was a crumpled old orange envelope as he explained it. And he said, we're the tribe of Manasseh and we want to come home. And he thought, the truth was this letter had been written ever since 1948 to every prime minister. Nobody had ever responded. They responded, they went out there, they saw these are Jews from the tribe of Manasseh who have been gone for thousands of years. They didn't even know that the temple had been destroyed in 586 BC. They didn't know anything about the second temple that was destroyed in 70. But they'd heard that Israel was reestablished in 1948. And they used to run out in the streets when storms would hit. By the way, as, as best as they can know from their history, they were driven out of the land, they went up into China for hundreds of years, and they were driven out of China back into Northeast India. They kept the Torah, they spoke some kind of Hebrew, but it was very ancient stuff, and, but all those years they remained one of the tribes of Israel. And, and they said that whenever there was a tornado or a great storm, some devastating thing, they would run out into the streets and they'd say, God, we are your children of Manasseh. We have not forgotten you. Don't forget us. And, and to be at the airport when 25 or 30 of these people came in and made Aliyah was one of the great moments of my life. Um, God is doing that. He's bringing them back from the four corners of the earth. What can you do about it? The Bible commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to be watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem. That's why we call our ministry the, um, the Zion's Watchmen. I'm getting signals here from Gary and I forgot what I was called. Okay. <laughs> Never miss a good chance to shut up. Silence is not always golden, but silence also is consent. If you don't speak up, in fact, by not speaking up when you know better, especially when it comes to Israel, then you are consenting to it. John, yep. The signal keep going. It's, it's raining like crazy out there, and I don't think I'm going anywhere. That's right. Amen. Keep up. What can you do about the rain? Nothing. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> I've got cattle who've never seen it. <laughs> They're two years old. <laughs> um, oh, I didn't even know this was on here, but this is good. This is country wisdom to live by. Don't expect the water to clear up until you get the hogs out of the creek. <laughs> Defend America by voting on the issue of Israel. Um, we're to speak out for Zion's sake. Um, Oh, by the way, we're going to Israel in April. But let me, let me preface this, because this may be for somebody who's here today. If you are, I don't want to say adventurous. If you're one of these people that have said, oh, God has, I wanted to go to Israel. He put this desire in my heart and all that kind of stuff. I still have four seats available, not for April, but for about three weeks from now. And it's the 1st of February to the 11th of February. This is designed for ministry leaders, for pastors, for people who are involved in some kind of ministry who are decision makers, who Israel's underwriting this. It's half price. To go with me in April, those tours, they're great tours, they cost $4,000. If you've got $2,000 and you want to go on the 1st through the 11th of February, I can fit you in to our group. I added somebody this morning, actually a pastor from uh, French Valley uh, and his wife. So I know, oh, gee, you know, I plan four years ahead of time. I can't react like that. Well, I don't need you on this one. <laughs> this is only about three weeks, but it is available. If you are interested and God really touches your heart, We'll take you, because I've got the rooms, I've paid for the airline seats, and um, Israel is doing this, why? Because they're worried that tourists are scared away by what's going on in the Middle East. 
And so for some of us, they've allowed us, they've put together, I put together a package. It's the same package that I do, a deluxe package for people to go with me. It's the same package, but they've cut the cost right in half. So it's $2,000, and um, that's just a lucky strike extra. If you want to know about our regular tours, I'm glad to tell you about them. This was a, this was a great event. I don't know who that cowboy is, but I took... I took a group up to Samaria. This is called the West Bank. There's never going to be a Palestinian state inside of Israel. You, if I'm wrong, so what? But I know they've been trying for 20, 30 years, everything we can do to push it. It's not going to happen because Ezekiel says these are the mountains of God. And he is preparing them, for, he says, for my people Israel to be on them. Anyway, there's some Jews up there who are farming in, in this land. You can see what kind of rugged land it is, but they have uh, vineyards. And so I was going to bring my group and we were going to help them. We, we were going to help them to harvest. And when I got there, the guy came out and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. We finished the harvest last night. And so I said, no, we came here to help. And he said, well, you know, I've got this root stock. If you guys want to start putting in a whole new vineyard, we can do it. Yeah, absolutely. So we're out there uh, planting that root stock. And he comes out and he says, you know what? This is Jeremiah 31.5. And it says in Jeremiah 31.5, again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. And he says, you're part of prophecy right now. And I, e even now I've got... Goosebumps. Yeah. That's going on there. <sighs> he's got this. This guy's a friend of mine from Tennessee. And he's a farmer from Tennessee, and he's been going over and helping these Jews for for years now. And he's got two sons. You remember the spies that Moses sent out? His his twin sons are Caleb and Joshua. Okay, so I'm walking up the this road right near there with Caleb and Joshua and they said oh I gotta tell you something that happened right here this was maybe 15 years ago when they were first putting in the vineyards and he said right over here the guy the the Jewish guy who was planting these was out at 2 a.m. in the morning on the tractor spraying because the, it's it's calm nobody else is out there and he was spraying the new rootstock that was in and he said a wind came up and started whirling around the tractor and blowing all this stuff in his face so bad that even with the lights on at night he couldn't see anything so he shut the tractor down and went up to his car and when he got to his car his cell phone was ringing and it was from the guards around this um, area and they said oh you're all right he said, yeah what's the matter well, they had just killed two terrorists who had come through the gates, had gone right up to where he was, and they would have killed him for sure because, he, you know, he's spraying. But this little duster came in, blew it all around, and he's alive today in that land. Is Those are miracles. Those are miracles that are still happening. Praise God. This is why I'm wearing this. You know why? This is a witness. Okay, my wife said, you're not wearing that shirt again, are you? I said, yes, I am. Well, people will think you're a real, well, never mind what they think. <laughs> it's pro-Israel. It means I'm for Israel. Okay, at first I had no idea the impact it would have. I literally have had hundreds of people all around the country. At first I forgot I had a sh shirt on that... You know, you wear shirts all the time, and normally nobody's going to say anything about it. People started coming up to me and going, yeah, right on, right on. And I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> and then I realized they're reacting to this. And then over the, over the months now, over the year that we've been selling these, um, people, I found it's a witness. And it's a witness, not only Christians, but it's a witness to Jews especially. We were at a, a pizza place and, and this lady kept going back and forth by our table and she finally stopped and she says, does that mean you're in favor of Israel? I said, yeah. I said, oh, my family, we're here from Israel. We're touring. We didn't know anybody even liked us. And anyway, 
it's, I ask people if they remark on it, I say, why did you say that? If, if they have a chance and they don't mind speaking about it. Some people will say, because the Bible tells us we ought to be pro-Israel. And, you know, right on there. Others, others have different reasons. I have these available. Um, but the idea is you are a witness no matter where you are. And if you're a witness for Israel, I will guarantee you, you will be a blessing to a lot of Jews because many Jews think they're kind of isolated. Nobody really understands that. And if they see somebody wearing one of these, and you can read the back of it later, um, it's, it's a heck of a blessing. It would be a blessing to us too. It's the only, it's the way I stay on the road uh, by selling these. So anyway, commercial's over. Oh, so's the show. <laughs> Sorry, I skipped it. Boy, Malad, I, I would have gotten out of here. You didn't have to.